Meeting adjourned. Mr. Harkin, can I speak to you? Yeah, sure, what is it? You know, for months you've been hinting that I was in line for that promotion. And look how hard you've been working. What, you were just lying to me? Lying? No, Nick. Motivating. I mean, look, we're all part of the same team here. Plus, you know, I'm the one who's going to be doing all the extra work. You know that last month you made me work so late, I missed saying goodbye to my gam-gam? I'm sorry, what? My grandmother, I told you that I needed to see her because she was very, very sick. You said if I left early, I'd get fired. And she died before I made it to the hospital. I'm sorry. Thank you. I had no idea that you called your grandmother. <laughs> sorry. Sorry you didn't get to say bye-bye to Cam Cam. I really, I really am. 2011's Horrible Bosses takes the idea of bad leadership to the extreme, but many people can relate to Nick's exasperation with his horrible boss, Dave. The movie highlights three different types of horrible bosses, so horrible that their subordinates conspire to murder them. Don't worry, it's a comedy. The reality of having a horrible boss, however, is no comedy. Fostering great work environments by focusing on employee experience is the idea behind the podcast, Relationships at Work, hosted by this week's guest, Russell Lolliker. He joins the podcast to discuss the challenges of embracing leadership and employee experience, globalization and the impact on leadership, the role of mentors in leadership development, the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and supporting emerging leaders on a budget. Let's get to it. Welcome to Next in Q, the podcast for contact center and customer experience professionals. Next in Q is brought to you by Happy Two Vision. Eliminate blind spots and see right through every conversation with Happy Two Vision. Learn more at HAPPITU.com. Now, here's your host, Rob Dwyer. Folks, this is going to be a fun one because today, Russell Lolliker is next in Q. Russell, professional talker, how are you? Delightful, Rob. Thanks for having me. I am so excited to have you on the show. Among other things, you have a fantastic podcast called Relationships at Work, in which you explore leadership and culture and all of the things that impact people in their work lives. But you also have like a, a real job. Yep. I work in a public service, uh, helping citizens travel and get the information they need. But uh, yeah, that's, that's, my, that's my regular gig on top of on the po podcasting and speaking and so forth. But yeah, that's, that's my foundation. So we're going to talk about leadership and culture and maybe some employee experience today. I want to know, however, was there a moment, uh, uh, ideally uh, a bad moment, where you recognized how important leadership and, and culture is at work? Did you have a bad boss at some point? You um, don't have to name had, names. We're not no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. No, I've had a few. I mean, I think everybody at this stage in their career would have had a few. I've had, it's not my light bulb moment. It wasn't my light bulb moment for what I'm doing now, but it certainly, it were the bread, it was the breadcrumbs that got me there. Um, <laughs> just like, like having bosses being in their office and yelling for my attention at, at, while I was like maybe 20 feet away, um, 30 feet away. Me meanwhile, instant messenger or walking over to my desk or a phone call to work. 
Um, yeah, I've been told that I was replaceable to my face. Um, nice. Yeah, I mean, we all. Oh yeah, it's <clears throat> it's 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 magical. It's mist- It's a fairy tale of happiness leaders. But my my big big aha moment. I was uh, and and funnily enough, how we kind of know each other is I. I was very much in the customer service space for a long time. Uh, speaking gigs, uh, had other podcasts based on that, a bit of notoriety. I was down in San Francisco on a panel uh, speaking on customer experience. I think it was the talk desk uh, conference down there. And I, I don't know what came over me, but I decided to have just some fun and walk around and ask people, hey, what about employees? Just for... <laughs> You know, just for giggles, <laughs> I, it was a very customer centric, uh, but there were a few murmurings of employees and treating employees better, but it was all very, very customer, customer, customer. The glazed eyes, Rob, this is 2018. When I said, <laughs> but what are you doing about employees? And they're like, oh, what? Uh, employees. Yeah, I, I guess we should do something. I'm like, my, I, my heart broke. It was just such a customer equals money conversation most of the mm-hmm. time. And it wasn't mm-hmm. really, but it's not a means to an end. How do you get to that point? And that involves culture, employee experience, and leadership. And that was my aha moment where I pivoted away from very much, obviously, customers benefit from the employee experience, but there weren't enough voices around the employee experience. I Googled. There were like 100 times the amount of books around customers experience than there was about employee experience. So I was like, you know what? I want to add my voice to this because I just hate people being treated badly. And that that was sort of my impetus to, to go down this path. Yeah, that is fascinating. And making that connection between how your employees experience what they do on a day-to-day basis and how that impacts customers should be a really easy connection to make for a lot of people. And yet, I still think that it's a struggle, (laughs) right? Yeah, yeah. Because it's not prioritized. Yeah, we've not gotten to a point where all of a sudden everyone is like, oh, focus on the employee and everything else will be hunky-dory. Well, I mean, this only shifted, Rob, in the last couple of years with the pandemic. I mean, it was, like I said, I had these conversations in 2018. And now in the last couple of years, suddenly we all are having these conversations because the, the... uh, the it's tipped more from an employer economy to a employee economy. Mm-hmm. So employers are almost being forced to go, oh, right, leadership that doesn't just involve creating a service and a widget to make money. We have to understand the path because they'll go somewhere else. They'll be very vocal about what their expectations and their demands are. The, 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 pot, the pandemic was a litmus test for a lot of leaders, realizing they just couldn't coast on being a leader because it says it in my job title or my job description, they actually had to show up as leadership and there were ramifications for that inaction or action that they took during that time. And that's where organizations are suddenly going, oh, we have to embrace this better. We're way better than we were a couple of years ago, but we still have a long way to go. Yeah, 100%. I do think that your point about the shifting of the balance of power is critical. And and the pandemic was a time where a lot of people reflected on the work they do, the environment that they do it in, and does this make me happy or uh, do I feel uh, the value that I want to feel? But I also think that Right, we have the largest generation in the history of at least North America that is now entering retirement, and that has shifted the balance of the workforce and how many people there are available to do jobs. And um, certainly, we're seeing it here in the U.S. Right? For those that don't know, you're you're one of our friendly neighbors to the north, and. In the U.S., we've seen unemployment levels at historic lows, and so that very much does mean that I can, depending on the role that I serve within my company, I can very easily go find another job across the street or um, 
virtually, I, I just stay in the same place that I'm at from a physical standpoint, but I, I work for someone else. It's really easy to do these days. I, I think the definition of things has changed. That's a big thing I talk about on my show is defining things because we use words all the time, but we don't ever actually define them. And, and, and I bring this up because defining work, what is work now? Mm. Work is working from home. Is it commuting an hour and a half? It could be both. It could be neither. It's the gig economy. It's uh, a stable public service job for, for years, government job for years and years. It, it It's changed. And I think it's changed more rapidly for us as employees because we see options. And I think a lot of organizations don't see options. They see what's always worked for them before. And so it's really trying to, and leaders definitely fall into that going, this is how I found success. Why can't my staff come into work? And it's not like you and I are Gen X and it's not like we didn't want all these things and all these options going up. We just didn't know we had the power to do so or say anything right. until these millennials and Gen Zers. And I'm like, oh, you can, you can talk back. You can have boundaries. <laughs> it was jealousy in my voice. It wasn't you are entitled. It was, I don't want to go to meetings either. <laughs> yeah. It's fascinating that work has changed much in the same way for a lot of different roles, the way commerce has changed, right? So when I was growing up, and I'm sure this holds true for you, we are... Still am, uh, still am, Rob. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> if you wanted something, whatever that was, you had a very limited amount of choices. You could go to... Uh, the, the local Walmart or other retailer like that, Target, Kmart, uh, rest in peace. You could go to the mall or you could go to maybe some independent shops around town. That was pretty much it. Today... Whatever it is, I can find it. I can find it online at a variety of different places and I can have it shipped to me. And that could be something that's brand new, something that's vintage. It could be, I, I bought an ice cream scoop that's just like the one that my grandmother always had at, at her house. It's, you know, the old one with the thumb press and the Bakelite handle. And I was able to locate that, find it at a price point that I felt good about and have it delivered to me. That has changed. The way we demand things has changed. And we're seeing that in the workplace as well. Globalization has been huge, um, mostly because of, of convenience. I mean, look at us again, back to the pandemic. We didn't, couldn't leave our houses, so everything had to come to us. So we were getting really well-versed in online shop. It was already going that way before, and it just accelerated uh, after the pandemic. But it also, as you mentioned, it flips to the workplace too, because with globalization also comes with organizations that now are global, all virtual, mm -hmm. but global. And what that brings with it is new cultures, new ways of thinking, diversity, and needs for inclusivity and equity and belonging. And a lot of leaders are not equipped to handle a lot of that. Uh, and it's not their fault. There's so little training for leaders that they're thrown in these positions. They're like, yeah, we'll give you some training in about a year, maybe 10 years, maybe 10, 15 years. Um, and, and so I feel horrible for a lot of leaders in that they're hamstrung already. But you bring up a great point is that with globalization, new challenges come for organizations that are trying to compete with what mm. customers are demanding. And that comes with its own challenges of, okay, well, time differences. Well, um, just how you show up. What does aggression look like at work versus uh, ambition? That could be different definitions based on your culture. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's definitely a new world for, for many organizations. You used a word just now when speaking about leaders, and that's being equipped. I think that most people, regardless of their role, whether they're in leadership or not, I firmly believe they want to do a great job at work. And leaders 
and leadership. Leadership is a skill. It is a learned set of skills. It's not a skill. It is a learned set of skills. Can you talk about some of the skills that are often things we haven't yet learned when we're first thrust into a leadership position and the common mistakes that come out of not being equipped? I think it's an interesting one because there's a lot of leadership skills that are also superhuman skills. And we talk about them, and this is why leaders have a bit of a challenge, is because we put people in positions of authority or influence that are maybe really good at the job, but not so good at the leadership piece. But because they did a job real good, or they fixed a problem for me that one time, they should be in a leadership position. It's the Michael Scott problem from The Office, right? Mm -hmm. He was an amazing sales guy, so he rose to the level of his incompetence, as my mom would say. Like he could not go any higher because he wasn't a leader. He was, and, and, and we have a lot of organizations where that it fits that bill as well, is that we don't ask questions in the job interview about other leaders that they created, about uh, the impact they had on the culture or the employee experience. It's just in this situation, did you still deliver the thing? Even though you came over to King Challenges, could you still be the person that gets me what I want when I want it? So we look at leadership as this other thing in organizations. Ooh, employee trust, trust-driven leadership, service-based leadership. Sure, they're all fun little keywords to say and do, but at the end of the day, it's all same skills we have as human beings. We have people talk about, can you build trust in the workplace? I don't know. Do you have friends at home? Do you have family members that will listen to you? It's the same stuff. It's the same skill set. We call them soft skills. God, I hate that. Uh, they're human skills. Soft just makes them lesser than, than, mm -hmm. than hard skills in comparison. But to be a leader, we have to lean into what it is to be human. And the two best things we can learn is self-awareness and situational awareness in that order. We have to know who we are, and then we have to know who we work with and around and what impacts there every day. Uh, I, I do a presentation where I talk about the impacts of leadership, good and bad, that they may or may not even know about. And one of the key things is that environmental assessment, that understanding of what's going on in the world. Even though we have no influence on those things, we still need to be very aware because our staff, our teams are showing up impacted by it. And I labeled like nine things that were happening in the world, ec economic issues, family issues, like all these things that could be happening at home that could absolutely impact the leader. And I'm like, and this is just Tuesday. Like this is just <laughs> the world as it is right now. And as leaders, we have to understand that those humans are coming in with these thoughts on their brain. There's no such thing mm. as a split between work and life. And as leaders, we have to understand that our impact, but also the impact that's already impacting them or we're horrible leaders. So what skills do they need? I think they just need to understand what it takes to be a better human. Look at the skill set they're already really successful at with their friends, their partners, anything they have in the workplace at home that they could bring into the workplace about being curious about, oh, curiosity is a big one. Um, not knowing everything, active listening. These are all the skills that help you have a better partner at home. <laughs> And yet, and yet, when we walk through that door, when we turn on that computer, suddenly we're a different person that looks at humans differently. It never made sense to me. Yeah. You reminded me of, I'm going to talk about my, my experience with a bad leader. <clears throat> you talked about, right, all of the things going on in the world, and it's just a Tuesday, right? And there are always things going on, some of which we can be aware of because they're worldwide or they're far reaching things. So economy, what's happening in, in another country from a political situation, these are things that we can all recognize. Um, there are also things that we may not have insights into that are happening within an individual's family situation or their financial situation or whatever the case may be. But I remember vividly walking into work on 9-11. I worked at a mortgage company 
at the time. I had seen kind of what was going on when I was at home getting ready for work. And then I get in and we're all just kind of talking about it. It's, you know, it's kind of the early internet days. So you can kind of, you can find news on the internet. Um, some of the people listening to this have no idea what it was like in the turn of the century with the internet, but um, there is just a lot of talk going around, right? People are, are really having a moment. And I'll never forget that the guy who managed our office came in and was like, it doesn't matter, get back to work. And his focus was very much not on the human aspect, to your point. His focus was, uh, this is a business, we make money, go make money. That's that's the job. And it it doesn't really matter what's happening outside of the job. And that was like a feeling of, yeah, no, like, this guy does not care about me. <laughs> I am just a means to an end. And I think you can take that and apply it more generically to how we interact with each other. And are we considering all of the things that impact how people are feeling on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, some of those things in our control, some of those things in our influence, and some of those things completely out of our influence or control. But just recognizing it is a great start. And neither one of us is saying that the job isn't important or results aren't important. It's just not everything. It's yeah. just how do we get there? And that's the human journey of getting to those results. Uh, productivity over humanity is not going to retain employees. No, no, it's not. This is not uh, relationships at work, by the way. You've been doing yeah. this podcast for a couple of years now, give or take. A little over two years, I think. Is that right? Uh, just over two years. Yeah, yeah. Just over two years. Can you talk about uh, maybe one of the most interesting conversations that you've had on that podcast and kind of what you got out of that? Oh, my goodness. That is impossible after 130 <laughs> episodes. I will say, I mean, I've been unbelievably grateful for for the guests that I've had on the show. You've recommended some phenomenal guests that have also been on my show as well. You've had some of my guests. Doug Raybold uh, was on your show yeah. recently, who was a huge favorite of mine because he was the first one that talked about neurodiversity in the mm -hmm. workplace mm -hmm. uh, on my show. Diversity, equity, inclusivity, that's an interesting one because... We throw the words around, again, we're back to these buzzy words and it's a, you get a cookie every time you say it, yeah. but it's important to actually know that it matters and it actually means something and it's not just a poster on a wall. And I've had some phenomenal guests, just to go down that path, where we talk about it absolutely how important it is to talk about it when we come to talk to race, but it also is important to talk about background. And mm. we pigeonhole diversity into this is what we envision diversity to be. A person that's not, that doesn't look like me. But it's not just looks. It's also neurodiversity versus, not versus, but neurotypical. Or mm -hmm. introverts and extroverts. Or, and in leadership, we try to do the easy thing a lot of the time because we want to, you know, make it iterative and repeat it over and over again because it's easier, it's quicker, we can move on to the next thing. But to get people to stay, you have to understand them as people. And that's important to understand their backgrounds, their economic situation. When we talk about diversity, I think that was the biggest mind opener for me was that it is not just this, you know, a, 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 a thing that is not me. It is mm. so many different aspects, ways of working, uh, racism, um, ageism. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, sexism. It is all these things that come at the workplace because we are surrounded in humans that I don't think we take seriously enough. And with the sheer number of DEI priorities and programs that are being removed or taken away in a lot of organizations, 
when they haven't even got to a level of integrating into their operations or their culture scares me quite a bit. Yeah. And, and we also ask those that are different to champion these things. It's like, but where's the people that are the problem should be championing these things. The people that are resistant <laughs> should be the ones championing it, not the ones that are like begging and pleading to be seen when they shouldn't have to. And I think that's been the biggest, I've had numerous guests talk about uh, challenges women face in the workplace, challenges uh, GLG, uh, LGBTQAI plus uh, have in the workplace, the fight to have employee resource groups uh, be meaningful and matter in the workplace. Um, yeah, it's it, that's probably been, I've had a few guests talk about different aspects of that, and that's been very eye-opening to me. Not that I didn't or wasn't aware, but just it solidified it so much for me is that this is an area that we need to pay way more attention to so that we don't have to think about it because it's just part of what we do. It's an interesting point that you bring up in that having a DEI led effort, we often choose someone whose voice we are saying, hey, we need to hear more about your voice. It's possible, and I don't know if this is the case, but it's possible that in doing that, we are not putting the kind of support behind it that is required of leadership to say, I'm not someone, right? I'll just use me, right? I'm a, I'm a straight white male in my mid forties. That's about as non DEI as you can get. I, I think as what most people would consider that, but by lending my support and my voice to those kinds of efforts may potentially draw more attention to it and get people to listen. And that hasn't, I think, in most organizations, been the path that they've chosen to go to, to lead those efforts. The challenge is, it's like that whole women, women in tech panels, and they're all white men. Like that's, that's a blaring, obvious challenge. The, the, the challenge it comes a lot with is that it's sort of this middle ground. So having a, a woman champion, uh, you know, equity in the workplace. Sure, absolutely. But also, it shouldn't be just on them to be yeah. heard and felt. But at the same time, if you give it to a straight, white, middle aged male, they'll be like, Oh, here's another example of you not giving a woman an opportunity to speak for women. So it, it can be seen from both aspects. Mm -hmm. of it. And, and, yeah. and not to say that I'm, I'm exactly in the same realm you are, and not to say my voice isn't important, but it's been the only voice for so right. long, the pendulum needs to swing. We need to hear, I can shut up for a while. You know what I mean? And, and we need to get to a collaboration space where I would like to see the DEI championship uh, championing done in partnership, not mm. thrown specifically to, well, I should do it because, you know, I, I'm not that. So I should be championing voices that aren't mine, but also the voices that need to be heard. We need to hear from them. So I'd like yeah. to see more of a collaboration and, and, and not only a collaboration, given influence and support and the resources to actually foster change and looking at it as a long game and not, well, we have some money this quarter. Let's uh, let's throw it at that for now. And yeah, let's review. It's a long game. This is how we change takes years, not um, not a, a, a court, like I said. So yeah, I'd like to see more collaboration more than anything. You work in the public sector. I wonder if part of the challenge in the private sector is that Change takes years, but my financials are reported every quarter. And are those two things at, at odds with each other? Or having spent time in the public sector, I think, what, uh, 13 years, or, or give or take? 
Oh, for do me, you, yeah, about that. Yeah, for you, do you find that the same challenges exist and it's it's not a public versus private sector thing, it's just a thing? It's just a thing. People are people, no matter what you put, whatever P word you put above it. We all have deliverables. Mm. We all have what success looks like for our organization. We all have cultures. We all have ways of working. So no, it's it's not different. The speed of work is different based on the industry you're in. It's based on the culture in which you work. It's what the leadership models. So I, you know, I, I, I understand there are different ways of working, but unless you're in both areas and have an understanding that every industry has some similarities, I've got experience in the, a lot of experience in the private sector. I talk to a lot of people in the private sector. Uh, my relationships at work is all about the private sector, but it's also about the public sector because it's about humans. Um, right. So it's, it's universal in, in what leadership is leadership and they're leading humans and those humans are just there to do the best they can. And it's just a question of how leadership is either making it easier or harder to show up every day. Yeah. And does that leadership even understand the impact they have every day, which is what my show's about is leadership impact and understanding it. So yeah, I don't see there being much of a difference because there's just some universal truths of how people need to and want to be treated. So I think one of the things that I would encourage the executives at any company is, is to foster equipping new leaders. But let's talk about the new leader that's in an organization that recognizes, I, I don't really know what I'm doing. And I don't have a formalized way that's being provided to me, a path to learn to learn the skills that I need to learn to become a better leader. What advice do you have for that person? Get a mentor, find a mentor. And it doesn't have to be within the organization you work. Um, I love the idea of virtual mentors. Simon Siddick can be a mentor of yours. Brene Brown can be a mentor of yours. It doesn't need to be somebody you know or somebody you talk to every day, but it does mean you have to learn. And you have to take, it, this is where self-leadership comes into it. As I mentioned before, organizations, I mean, the example you give is universal. It happens everywhere. <laughs> so if you want to show some leadership, it's not sitting there crossing your arms going, yep, I'm waiting for the next course they're going to pay for. You literally are a leader. You are sitting and waiting to be led. So if you want to be a leader and show you leadership, that comes with that self-awareness where you have to learn. You have to foster your own professional development because it's not necessarily going to come at you. Every organization is different. Some do give that training. Some do have leaders that prioritize professional development, continuous learning. But that's not always the case, nor is it varied. Some organizations will have a very stringent, this is what leadership is, and it isn't real leadership. It is their definition of leadership. So I think to be a good, strong leader, you need to have a bigger view of the world. You need to have a bigger worldview. And that comes with different perspectives. That comes with different experiences that you're not necessarily going to get in the role you have. So having a mentor in your organization so you can understand the culture and what success looks like in that organization, because your definition of leadership might be different than their definition of leadership, but going out and finding community online uh, through podcasts like this one or my own podcast. Uh, that's where we learn and open our minds to looking at new ways of working and new ways of leading. So I think as an emerging leader, as a new leader, we have more work to do other than just learning what's in the job description. We have responsibility and accountability as leaders, whether our organization believes that or not, we do. Mm, I love that. I want to. I want to talk about Twitter. Uh, so a little bit of background. Your background is in communications, social media management. Um, for a long time, you managed uh, social media at uh, the Ministry of, of uh, Transportation and Infrastructure for, for British yeah, Columbia. Yeah, you got it all. Yeah. So... Can you tell me just kind of your, th I think this intersects a, a little bit in the, the communication and leadership. 
the the changes that we're seeing in in social media, some of that specific to Twitter uh, or X as as Elon has now uh, branded it. What has your experience been with that as a medium for communicating with with customers and or talking about leadership as we've sure. seen some changes? So you've you've tapped into a bit of my background in the sense that so my view on leadership and my perspective it comes from a communications lens lens not an HR lens but a humanity leadership communication lens and one of I I did I've done some work before even in in government before in in consulting and so forth around social media and I'm not a social media guy I'm a people guy and we just have these new tools called social media that allow us to interact and exchange with people. Twitter's X is no different. Uh, I've done a lot of com uh, speaking gigs actually around building public trust. The thing is, is that public trust is, it's, it is what it is based on who you're talking to. X has got a lot more profile because of the vitriol on it. It's definitely gone more of little moderation. So I look at it as two things. One, there isn't an alternative to Twitter or X. There is not. There's threads, there's a whole bunch of other platforms that are good, that are great to varying degrees. But the people that already are on Twitter are on there and, and don't plan on leaving. And that doesn't just come with one political viewpoint or one way of looking at the world. I'm not a big fan of umbrella statements when it comes to Twitter's a horrible place. I'm never going to go there again, as you hear from a lot of people. It is for some, absolutely. It's horrible for other people. Uh, speaking as a cis white male, it's a lot easier for me than it is for others mm -hmm. uh, being on that platform. So I'm, I'm keep in mind, I'm speaking it from a very privileged position. But when it comes to getting information out as an organization, private or public, it is just another channel to understand where your audience is. Where are your customers? If they're on it, you're using it. Um, you can have very normal, honest conversations on there, um, but to avoid it, I think, is not understanding who your audience is. You're thinking about yourself and not thinking about others. Um, in my experience, uh, it still was very powerful, even with the change over. Um, was it great? Did it have new problems? Absolutely. Um, but there, it wasn't the only place we spent our time. We looked at other platforms because audiences want information differently. They want to consume information differently. They want to engage with your organization differently. So you need to embrace all the tools. Uh, X is just one. And yeah. maybe Blue Sky will finally be a thing. Maybe Threads will really be a thing. Maybe, you know, Mastodon will actually be easy to use. Um, <laughs> until that's... That's not going to happen. <laughs> no, of course not. I, I'm an optimist. I'm not. I'm a realist. But I have aspirations of being an optimist. <laughs> so I think it's really understanding who your audience is and making decisions based on what their needs and their wants, where they want to engage with you rather than going crossing arms and go, we know better, we're crossing off that. But also keep in mind, we're going to go back to the employee experience here. Understand what you're putting your employees through while mm -hmm. being on these platforms. Mm -hmm. I found Facebook to be more horrible of an experience for employees sometimes. Uh, people feel more comfortable being extremely personal attacks on Facebook than they were on Twitter. I don't know why, but it, it, that was some of the experience that I've seen. So understand that you're putting employees through the hate ringer, the, the fire hose of, you know, hatred about your brand, about something that's beyond your control. But it is a communication channel. So I think it's not a, a gut reaction conversation. I think it's a strategic conversation. And, uh, and I think more organizations need to understand how they engage, why they engage. I think that's always my favorite is when people are like, we're going to be on Twitter. I'm like, but why? Because uh, uh, everybody's on it or my boss told me to be. Great. Try to figure out a strategy around that uh, to be successful. But you have to figure out the why. And X, Twitter just falls under that conversation. You hit on a number of things that I think organizations can struggle with. And, and coming from a contact center background, 
are the channels that we choose to engage with our customers is a, a critical one. And I don't think we often think about the impact that that has on the employee. Sometimes we're, we're focused on the, the customer or we're focused on the idea of, I need to be accessible everywhere as a brand, right? All the channels, just give me all the channels and I will, I will be on them all. And that may work for some brands, but it's not for everyone and it's not for every brand. And if you're not thinking about your point, the why, first of all, and also the experience that the employees are going to have communicating uh, back and forth through that channel, you're setting yourself up for potential failure and disaster. The mental health impacts that can be felt by employees that are basically being yelled at every day. I'll be honest, I used to work in a call center and I was the front line uh, to, a, to that information center we would transfer people to the complaint department. The complaint department was the sweetest gig in the organization. And I'll tell you why. One, they got paid a little bit better. But also two, when people pick up the phone and they're angry, they will throw all their anger at you. So by the time they get to the complaint center, they're good. They're actually relaxed. They're okay. They've got it all out. So it's that frontline underpaid staff that just got all the hate and the, the, the complaint center gets to get all the love because they have a problem to try to fix as mm -hmm. opposed to being yelled at and demeaned for 15 minutes because I couldn't transfer you. You had a fire hose of information to get out of you as a customer. And I have to listen. I'm there as a customer service agent. But then, like I said, you transfer it out. And it's like, uh, I'm like, yeah, I'm glad I got all of that. Right. So, but right. think about the mental health that I impacted me and I have to take that home and I have mm. to then engage with my partner, my kid, however that is in the workplace. Yeah. Yeah. Means to an end, right? Yeah. It's very difficult too, because you probably weren't equipped with the same ability to address the issue or resolve the issue, right? I imagine the complaints department to do things that you couldn't do. They were empowered. That's why they also made more money per hour than I did. Um, right. Yeah, thankfully I have a long background of being a bartender and working in restaurants. So I'm used to people <laughs> being unhappy <laughs> uh, to varying degrees. So I, I'm able to take it, but you're right. Not everybody's equipped skill set wise, empowerment wise to feel like they make a difference and instead feel like a punching bag. So we've talked about what a new or emerging leader can do if they don't have a clear path. Let's talk about someone who is at an organization and wants to establish some tools to help their leaders be successful. But perhaps they're not being provided a, a budget or they they may feel like there's going to be some pushback against this. We, we mentioned earlier um, some of the looming pushback that is happening around DEI efforts, right? So sometimes there's, there's pushback at the highest levels to some of the things that some of us think are really important and, and will help our organizations. What can I do if I'm in that situation to help support my emerging leaders and maybe do it on a budget? I think the best resource you have, and people are going to hate me to say this, is your time. Because one of the hardest things we have for great leadership is I'm too busy. If you're mm. too busy, you're not a leader. You are being pushed around by a calendar. You are jumping to one meeting to the next. You're not leading anybody. You're being led. You're a commodity. And we fall into that trap because, unfortunately, things need to get done. Great. Not leadership. 
not modeling leadership. So I think the most important thing you can offer a team, first off, is your time. Uh, one of the most impactful things I did, I led a team of 12 years that didn't leave. It was the exact same team for 12 years. Uh, we had one of the highest retention rates in the entire organization, if not the highest retention rate. And one of the best things that I could do for them was offering them my time and my attention when they needed it and also when we scheduled it. So I was very accessible. I, I've said this and I'll say it again, an open door policy, the least important thing in that sentence is the door. It's about psychological safety. It's about the door can be closed. Like I, my door was always closed because my voice carries. I have a big voice. So I close the door all the time, but my team knew they could knock on the door. They could make funny faces in the window to get my attention or they could, you know, just come in. But I think we need to, and that comes back to time. So we would schedule regular half hours, one-on-ones, two-on-ones with my co-manager uh, where it was the employee's time, not my time. Not, not my time to dictate, not my time to what we talked about, but their time to have conversations about professional development, what was bothering them, uh, colleagues that were driving them nuts, uh, how they saw the organization going, how they saw the team going, what courses they wanted to take, whether it had anything to do with work or not, stuff that was going on in their lives. But it was their half an hour to just half. And even though we talked all the time, they just valued that half an hour because I made it available to them. I tried canceling it a few times going, does this really work for you? Do you find value? Oh, the pushback. They're like, no, I want to reschedule it when it doesn't happen. I don't want to wait till the next time. They found it so valuable as a human talking to human conversation that was beyond the day-to-day, -day, beyond operations, beyond deliverables, beyond what actions we need to take or professional development, checkbox, checkbox. It was two humans that work together and like working together that want to get to know each other. So I think the first thing you can offer is time. And the second thing you can offer is your ears, um, is listening, situational awareness. That comes not only in those times where you're talking, but just watching your team work together, see how they interact with each other. Where can you help? Where can you stand the hell out of the way? Where can you remove obstacles for them? They may not be that communicative. Like I said, they could be introverts. They may not communicate in the same way you are. But as a leader, you need to know your team and how they work and how you can serve them. Not serve up, serve your team. Uh, and last, if anything, I will say it's about understanding you can only control what you can control. There are so many toxic workplaces out there. However, as a leader, your team doesn't need to be a toxic environment. As a leader, you can try to protect that team. You can create your own culture within a team of two, within a team of 15. How you show up, why you show up, what success looks like, all to serve the masters and the vision and the mission of the organization. Sure, you have deliverables, but what you can influence and control within your sphere, understand, that is huge. And that can model behavior for others, or it can't. People will decide what they wanna to listen to and model, that's up to them. But you can do this where you're helping your own team and building relationships with other like-minded people in other teams within the organization. I, I, and there's great organizations where you still might need to do this to make it more personal for your team specifically. So I think those are three things we really can do to, to really shift leadership within our, own, within our own area. I absolutely love all of that. And I have to tell you how much I have valued my time that I've gotten to spend with you today. It is an Too honor wrong. and a privilege. <laughs> uh, if you don't already subscribe, please check out Relationships at Work. It is a fantastic resource for established leaders, emerging leaders, people who want to think about how they are performing within a, a leadership role and what they can do to be even better. It is full of insightful moments and you get to listen to this guy's voice. It's, it's pretty amazing. Um, thank you, Russell, so much for joining today. 
Absolutely my pleasure, Rob. Thank you so much. And thank you for being uh, such a supporter of the show. And uh, I, I'm a Rob fan by far. So thank you so much, sir. I love what you're doing. And I'm thrilled that I was be able to be a small part of it. Thank you. Next in Q is brought to you by Happy To and is produced by me, Rob Dwyer. If you enjoy this podcast, please, by all means, subscribe and or rate this podcast in iTunes or your favorite podcast app. But more importantly, please tell just one person about this podcast. Word of mouth is the best way for people to discover new content. As always, thanks for listening.